in this segment, <clears throat> I guess we're doing two in the same night. So <clears throat> I'm uh, on a roll. We just concluded our series on the atonement. And before <clears throat> I delve into the resurrection, uh, there's an issue that I, um, I thought that might be of interest to some of you. And that is the question, what happened uh, to Christ after he breathed his last uh, on the cross? Um, in other words, did Christ descend into hell? And for many of you, the Apostles' Creed uh, is something that we have recited since we were children. And um, there's different versions of it. <clears throat> but my guess is that um, for those of you who do or have recited, uh, recited the creed, <clears throat> you have um, you, you've heard the saying at the, uh, where it says, And Christ descended into hell. What's that all about? Have you ever wondered about that? Well, let's um, let's discuss that. Did Christ, after accomplishing our redemption on the cross, did he descend into hell? And as I said before, we you know, in between talking about the atonement and um, the resurrection, I thought this would be an appropriate time to discuss this. Did Jesus descend into hell after he died and before he rose from the dead? During those three days, did he descend into hell? Many people say that he did, and they give various reasons for it. And my desire is to try, to, to try <laughs> and attempt to answer this question. Now, first of, all, first of all, the Apostles' Creed is is not like other creeds that we sometimes read. For example, the Nicene Creed was um, written in 325 and I think revised later. Uh, the Chalcedonian Creed was revised, uh, excuse me, was written in 451. Basically, the guys wrote it, they went home. <laughs> After they wrote it. But that's not the way the Apostles' Creed was. It was more of like a snowball. You know how, at least if you're from up north, you get a small ball of snow, you roll it down a hill, and it collects more and more snow as it goes down the hill. And that's the way the Apostles' Creed did. Uh, as the time went on, more additions were um, were getting, you know added to it and uh, over time so <clears throat> the earliest copies of the apostles creed did not have this phrase in it descending into hell it's, that's left out it just said he died buried, um, rose again. Um, in fact, it was not until the year 390 A.D., that's 300 years, about 300 years after the last apostle died, it was not until about 390 A.D. that a man named Rufinius first stated that he found a manuscript with, um, which had this phrase descended into hell in it. That is, that's the first time that anybody had discovered a manuscript and they realized that it was something new uh, at that time, Rufinius did. Um, so this is 300 years after um, you know the apostles died. Like I said, that's a long time. But, and this is, I think, significant, um, 
not only did it have the addition to send it into hell, but it also had an omission in it. And that is that it omitted the phrase that um, he was buried in a grave. Um, now that's significant, and I'll try to explain why. Um, descending into Hades, into Sheol, or hell, um, could be substituted for the word grave um, because it can mean the grave or the place of the dead or simply the dead. Um, the word Sheol, hell, ladies, and so forth can be variously translated, and um, especially Sheol. But in addition to that, the next manuscript after that to have this phrase descended into hell was not until 650. So you have the first Apostles' Creed with descended into hell at 350 AD, excuse me, 390. And then the, the next one after that was not until 650. So um, that is just kind of an interesting historical, um, uh, I think, uh, uh, I guess, um, I think it's pretty significant historical detail, yeah, um, regarding that. But anyway, some have said that the intent was to stress that Jesus was not just merely sort of dead, but he was most sincerely and really dead. Um, the point being is that the issue that whoever was changing the language there was trying to stress the fact that Jesus was really dead. You know, if that's the case, then, you know, that's, that's a good point. The New Testament is uh, very clear in the fact that um, Jesus was very much uh, dead with reference to his human nature, three days dead. His heart had stopped beating, um, no brain waves. He was very much dead, uh, just as any other human being would be. Um, there, his body was was a corpse, and his divine nature was um, perfectly united with the corpse at that point. Okay, now there are several opinions as to what this phrase means. First of all, um, folks have said that uh, it means that Christ experienced hell on the cross, Descending into hell means that Christ experienced hell, uh, hell on the cross. And I think we would all agree that there's a sense in which Christ did experience hell on the cross. The wrath of God was poured out upon him. I made a big point of that in my teaching on the cross, that he was a uh, propitiation. But the problem is that the, the phrase, he descended into hell, is found after Jesus has died in the text. It says in the text that Jesus had died, uh, buried, and then it says he, he um, descended into hell. So that's not possible as far as an explanation, experience in hell on the cross, because it's just mis it's misplaced. It's in the wrong place. It's, um, if he had... Um, you can't say you can't say Jesus experienced hell on the cross um, after he's already dead. So, already second second explanation of this phrase in the Apostles' Creed is that Christ proclaimed victory to the Old Testament saints. Third explanation is that Christ proclaimed to the damned, be it angels or humans, that they were damned. Um, and then lastly, Jesus proclaimed a second chance to people 
And no, absolutely not. Uh, that's contrary to all the Bible teaches regarding the finality of death and judgment. So, um, what did happen when Jesus breathed his last on the cross? I'm sure you've thought about that at some time or another. There are some verses in the New Testament, Testament which seem to suggest that he visited the underworld. Um, what I call the theology of the first glance uh, does seem to suggest that, but I do personally, upon further reflection, I, I don't think that the Bible teaches that. But uh, let's talk this through and hear some common notions, okay, uh, regarding this uh, this idea and try to give it a fair shake as far as the different notions. Okay, the first um, idea comes from Peter's first um, sermon uh, at Pentecost, where he says, for you, he's quoting, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption, Acts 2.27. Some have said, uh, or seeing this as a basis for Jesus going to Hades. But my first point is it actually says the opposite. He will not abandon my soul to Hades. And more importantly, the issue is that as the sinless one, Jesus, death could not hold him. Um I think the point is that um, he was not being, he's not going to, the father was not going to abandon him to death because death could not have a hold on him. You see, the only reason that we die, uh, even as Christians, uh, it's not punitive. It's simply because we live in a fallen world um, and it's a consequence of sin. But Jesus didn't sin. So to put to state a, ne a double negative, Jesus could not not stay dead. Or excuse me, he could not not rise from the dead. Um, yeah, he could not not rise from the dead. He had to rise from the dead because he could not stay dead since he was sinless. Was death? Death is a consequence of sin. So, righty. Secondly, um, quoting from Romans ten six and seven, um, some folks um, look to this verse as to to state that Jesus um, went into the lower regions. Um, but the righteous based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. Romans 10, 6 and 7. Okay. Some think that this verse affirms that Jesus descended into the abyss. However, if you look at the text clearly, it says, do not say, <laughs> do not say. So um, that would be affirming precisely what the Bible says not to affirm. That's an example of that, really. Okay, the next one comes from, I believe, from Ephesians. It says, um, when he uh, ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he uh, he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Now, um, some translations, I think, read uh, he, he also descended into the lower regions uh, of the earth, end of the earth or something like that. But I'll explain where I'm going going to. Based on this text, where it says descended into the lower regions, 
the earth. Um, based on this text, folks have asserted that Jesus descended into the lower regions, um, you know, wh whatever that is. However, um, the general editor of the e uh, ESV, the English Standard Version Bible, Wayne Grudem, I've, I heard him explain the translation of this very verse and the issues uh, surrounding it. Um, I had the privilege of hearing his explanation. Um, his point and his explanation, and you have to put on your thinking caps here, is that this is what is known as a genitive of apposition, which explains why it reads, the lower regions, comma, the earth. The first translations of the SV didn't have that, and then they changed it because they realized that it is what is known as a Greek as the genitive of apposition. There is a comma between the two, the lower regions, the earth. Okay, I'll read it again. It says, he also descended into the lower regions, comma, the earth. All right. There is a comma between the two. The lower regions and the earth are synonyms. He descended into the lower regions, that is, the earth. That's the sense of the Greek in this appositional um, um, setup. The Greek, Greek construction is appositional. There's no descent to lower regions in, in this text. It's, um, like I said, he, the best way to translate it is that he descended into the lower regions, comma, the earth. Alrighty? It'd be something like saying, I live in Greensboro, North Carolina. It'd be like saying, um, he came to Greensboro, comma, North Carolina, um, or something like that. Um, hope that made sense. Fourthly, and this is, uh, I think the most, uh, interesting, and this comes from First Peter. It says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and pro proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey. When God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were um, brought safely through water. He did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness of seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. Um, okay. Now. Um, some have seen this as being various things. Um, Spirits of angels, um, you name it. I'm just going to tell you what I think it says. I understand the spirits here, Pneuma, um, which can mean either humans or angels. It depends upon the context. So I understand spirits here as the unsaved humans of Noah's day. Okay? Just bear with me. You know, obviously, feel free to disagree, but just listen. <laughs> Christ in the Spirit, 1 Peter 3.18, proclaim the gospel in the days of Noah, verse 20. Through Noah, Christ proclaim the gospel in the days of Noah through Noah. 
the non-believers who heard Christ preaching through Noah did not obey in the days of Noah, verse 20, and are now experienced in judgment and are the spirits in prison, verse 19. Let me explain why I come to that conclusion. Peter himself, in his second epistle, calls Noah a herald or preacher of righteousness. 2 Peter 2.5 Where the word herald translates the Greek word kerux, preacher, which corresponds to the noun caruso, proclaim, which is used in our text, 1 Peter 3.19. So you have a correspondence of, of very significant language in the Greek of Caruso, which has to do with um, either preaching the good news, proclaiming preaching. But it's, Peter says that the Spirit of Christ, and this is what Peter says, Peter says that the Spirit of Christ was speaking through the Old Testament prophets. This is found in 1 Peter 1.11. And that's, just, that's significant for my argument. I'll say it again. Peter says in his first epistle, verse 11, um, chapter 1, verse 11, he said, Peter says that the Spirit of Christ was speaking through the Old Testament prophets. Hence, Christ could have been speaking through Noah as an Old Testament prophet to his contemporaries. He had a long time to do it, a hundred and some years, to preach to them. The context indicates that Christ was preaching through Noah, who definitely was a persecuted minority. And God saved Noah, which is, when you take it in the context of, of, of whom Peter is talking to in his epistle, it's very similar to the situation in Peter's time, where there's a persecuted minority, and Christ is preaching through Peter, through a similar persecuted, persecuted minority, and God will save them as well. Okay, that's my, my response, short and to the point. All right, how about some reasons to not think that Jesus went to hell? My first reason um, is that I don't think there's any reason to think that he could or needed to. I don't. I, just, I don't see. I don't see any reason for Christ to have gone to hell. But that's not even number one on my sheet. Okay, from Scripture, why I don't think Jesus went to hell after he breathed his last and before he was raised from the dead. It says in Luke twenty three forty three. And Jesus said to him, to the thief, Truly, I say to you today, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Okay, now paradise and, and, and heaven are synonyms in the New Testament, contrary to what some people think. And so I don't think it's possible. Jesus in his human nature cannot be ubiquitous. He can only be in one place at one time. So if he's in paradise or in heaven with his father, then he cannot be in hell too. Secondly, um, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. That would be his human spirit. And when we die... This is like a um, Jesus as a forerunner for us, um, similar to what happens to us when we die. 
When he said it is finished, that was a cry of victory. The finished work of cry on the cross. The finished work of Christ on the cross. And when he had cried, it is finished. And he dismissed his human spirit to the Father in heaven. Just as any human would uh, go after death. And then, again, a similar text from, from Luke says, <clears throat> While the sun's light failed and the curtain was temple, the temple was torn in two, then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It's similar to the other text, but it adds, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And after having said this, he breathed his last, Luke 23, 46. Again, you have what happened when Jesus breathed his last. He committed his spirit into his father's hands and said that he would be with the thief in his father's presence that day. And we're told in Scripture that Jesus died as the first fruits of believers, showing what would happen to believers when we die. All right, moving on from there, giving some reasons, other reasons. Just as Old Testament believers, believers were justified by faith alone, just as we are, Romans 4, it seems apparent to me that Old Testament believers went to heaven upon death. I mean, why not? I know it's I know it's popular for folks to talk about this holding place for Old Testament saints. I don't I really don't know where they come up with because uh, y'all the word for Sheol can mean two or three different things, but it usually just means the place of the dead. It doesn't designate. The destination, though, it, it designates that the person is dead, but it doesn't designate whether or not they're in heaven or hell. There's times where it can indicate one or the other. But remember, we have progressive revelation where the destination of the, um, the die, the, the people who die um becomes their destination becomes clear but that doesn't mean the destination's any clearer uh in the in the new testament it just means the revelation of their destination is clear just like um the resurrection of the dead and uh, the trinity and then so forth the deity of christ all these things are clear in new testament but but they were they were true in the Old Testament as well. So my point being is that um, Old Testament believers went to heaven when they died. Okay, so Christ's death worked backwards to them, just as it works forwards to us. Then also, think of the examples of Enoch and Elijah. They both ascended up to heaven before they died. To me, that's a clear indication that they went to heaven. Right? Okay, paradise is not, again, contrary to common opinion, paradise is not a different concept in heaven. Okay, they're, they're synonymous. Uh, Abraham's bosom, bosom is not a different place either. Um, uh, another argument would be that Hebrews 11 and 12 to me, seems to indicate that the Old Testament saints are, uh, since they're clouds of witnesses, they're cheering us on, which would certainly indicate that um, they are conscious in heaven and rooting us on. And um, we have Moses and Elijah conversing with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration when it was still technically the Old Testament indicating that they were in heaven as well. Um, so, 
And then it also says uh, regarding Abraham in Hebrews 11.10, it says, For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. As I think he's looking forward to going to heaven when he died. Um, but again, just because things like heavenly destination and so forth were not as clear to the believers in the Old Testament doesn't mean the destination itself was unclear or that it was different from New Testament believers. I think that's uncalled for and there's no need for it. Um, it just complicates things. To me, it's just um, when as soon as Adam and Eve died, um, it's, Assuming that they knew Christ, um, they went to heaven. And uh, all the seed of the women have gone to heaven since then, and all the seed of the serpent have gone to hell uh, since then. So, I see no biblical, good biblical reason for Jesus to have descended into hell. That's it. Next time. The resurrection. That's Friday, but Sundays are coming. Thank you.